<laughs> well, good afternoon and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My name is Don Wolfensberger and I direct the Congress Project uh, here at the Center and also I'm your, your moderator for today. Um, I know we have a few new faces, so let me just briefly explain uh, what the Woodrow Wilson Center is about and also the Congress Project. Uh, the Wilson Center was created by an act of Congress back in 1968 as a living memorial to our 28th president, and Woodrow Wilson is still the only president to have earned a Ph.D., and as many of you know, before he became a politician, before he ran for governor of New Jersey, he was a college professor and then president uh, at Princeton. Uh, then he ran for uh, governor of New Jersey in 1910 and then for the presidency in 1912. But Wilson believed very strongly that uh, if you brought together the scholars and the policymakers for an exchange of views, they would both benefit from the experience. And so that's why Congress decided to make us a living memorial to Wilson rather than just another statue on the mall. Um, what we have been doing here with the Congress Project over the last uh, 10 years, roughly, it'll be the 10th anniversary in June, is uh, following that same spirit by bringing together uh, members of Congress of each party or senior staff, people from the executive branch, and scholars who write, study about Congress and write about Congress, and journalists who, who cover the Washington uh, policy scene. And uh, we have a, a seminar every uh, two months roughly here, and uh, that's, uh, we look at a policy issue and how the policy process works on that, who the, who the policy makers are, what the politics of the issue are, and so on. So today we have a very timely subject. This is the, I think, the penultimate in our two-year series uh, that is, was really organized around the 2008 presidential election leading up to and now following uh, that election and looking at how Congress will deal with the new administration and vice versa. And, uh, and today's issue, of course, is the presidential nominations and the Senate confirmation process, uh, which we are right in the middle of. Uh, I looked at uh, the uh, latest uh, data on Friday, and I think thus far the Senate has confirmed uh, 30 nominees that have been sent to it, including 12 of the 14 openings uh, for cabinet departments. Uh, Mr. Gates did not have to be confirmed again at uh, defense. So there are two uh, cabinet uh, secretaries that still have to be uh, confirmed by the Senate, the Labor HHS and uh, what's the other one? Commerce, I guess, uh, after a couple of uh, aborted starts there with the uh, nominees uh, Richardson and then Judd Gregg. Uh, Gary Locke uh, is now the, the nominee for the, the Commerce Department. But the other uh, ones that have been confirmed are sub-cabinet uh, positions, uh, although you may have, uh, if you go by what Paul Volcker has said, uh, poor Tim Geithner over at Treasury is playing the lead role in Home Alone. Uh, but uh, he hasn't had any of his uh, sub-cabinet secretaries, assistant secretaries or whatever uh, confirmed yet. But he does have some advisors over there, plus a few hundred civil servants. So it's not exactly like it's an, an empty building, but I guess he's sort of the poster child for uh, some of the a real hard digging that has to be done once you get the top level folks confirmed and that is getting some assistance for them. I think if we look at the the plum book there are about 7,000 political jobs uh, in Washington that come up uh, whenever you have a new president and of those about 1,100 are ones that are confirmable by the Senate but if you look at the data you'll see a lot bigger numbers there as to how many the Senate deals with each year or in each Congress and, and that's because there are also a lot of military commissions uh, uh, people that are promoted within the public health service or the foreign service. So those also get Senate confirmation. But probably the vast majority of these confirmable things are, are done on block, unanimous consent. So they aren't all subject to hearings or debates on the Senate floor. Uh, I think someone has estimated maybe four to 500, though, still are ones that do get uh, separate votes and some uh, consideration by committees and by the, the Senate floor. Today we're very... Uh, pleased to have with us uh, some folks that have done work on various aspects of the Senate confirmation process, and I thought it would be good to have both someone that has worked at the executive branch level in uh, helping to, if not vet the uh, folks and select them, at least help prepare some of the nominees for the confirmation process. Uh, and so we are pleased to have with us uh, Gary Andres, uh, who has done that uh, with the, the Bush II administration. He took a year off from his work at Dutco Worldwide to help with some of the nominees in the Bush administration 
in 2001. And uh, in addition to that, Gary has worked on the Hill in a previous existence, but he's been in the lobby community, and he's the director of uh, public policy and research, or I should say vice chairman at Dutco. So Gary is uh, one of my favorite people over the years because uh, he uh, has a, a very much an interest in scholarship as well as policymaking. He's a Ph.D. from the University of Illinois, uh, Chicago, and he uh, writes widely both for scholarly journals as well as a regular column for the Washington Times and a contributor to, uh, I think, Politico Online. And so Gary keeps uh, on top of uh, all the political developments here in Washington and is really uh, a fun person to read. So Gary will be leading off showing that end of the nomination process from the executive branch in and what goes in into that. And then we're going to follow up uh, Gary's talk, and each person's going to take about 15 minutes, with uh, James Flug, who had been with uh, Senator Kennedy both uh, back in, I think, 1967 to 72, and then he was a, a public interest lawyer and has served in the executive branch as well as on the Hill. And then he came back to help out Senator Kennedy on the Judiciary Committee again in uh, 2005, 2006, I believe. Is that correct? Thereabouts when we had some nominations up for the Supreme Court, as you may recall, Alito and Roberts. And, of course, uh, briefly we had the name of Harriet Myers. I don't remember I, whether she was put into nomination and then withdrawn. I believe that was the situation. But uh, anyway, we, that was followed up by the Alito and Roberts uh, conf or confirmation hearings. Um, if we'll go third with our, uh, re our guest scholar today, Sarah Bender, who has been here several times, but she is in the process of writing a book on the politics of advice and consent. So I think this fits in nicely with her larger project, and she's going to be looking at something that you don't hear a lot about. Well, we did hear a lot about it uh, couple years ago, and that's lower court nominations. As you may recall, a lot of those were hung up uh, when George uh, W. Bush uh, was president, and there were threats by the, uh, the Senate uh, majority leader at the time, Bill Friss, to, uh, to go nuclear, whatever that might mean, but it sounded pretty dangerous. But uh, this has become more and more of a fascinating area, is the, uh, the nominations of people to the federal appeals courts and to the uh, district courts. Um, Sarah has uh, her Ph.D. from, I believe, the University of Minnesota. Is that correct? And uh, she is pr probably one of the best political science writers that I know, researchers and writers. She is just top-notch. And uh, Lee Hamilton, who could not be with us today because he's serving on another commission, believe it or not, but he passes on his regards and, and reminded me that Sarah used to work on his staff many, many years ago. So uh, welcome again, Sarah, to, to the Wilson Center. And then uh, finally we're going to hear from David Kirkpatrick, who is a Washington correspondent for the New York Times, and we're fortunate to have him because he covered both the Alito and Roberts and Myers uh, things back in 2005-2006, and he's covered the 200, 2008 uh, presidential campaign, and more recently has been covering some of the nominations of the Obama administration. So he's got, I think, a perspective of a journalist both on judicial and executive branch uh, nominations. So uh, let me just remind you all, uh, we are being a live webcast. Please turn off any electronic devices that you might have because they will interfere both with our audio system and with the transmission of our, of our live webcast. But we do want to also welcome our viewers that are watching us uh, live on their computers. We're across the nation, uh, and uh, I'm sure that they have a, a very informative session ahead. So stay with us. And with that, I'll turn things first over to Gary Andrews. Great. Well, thanks, thanks, Don, and thanks for inviting me to be here. Um, I thought <clears throat> I would kind of take you back in time for uh, a little bit and uh, tell you how I uh, got some of this uh, experience in the Senate confirmation process. If you, as you recall. After the 2000 election, uh, there was a little bit of a dispute about who, who won, and uh, uh, things uh, in terms of the transition process were a little bit delayed, so that once you got to uh, uh, President Bush uh, being, being sworn in, in in January, he had uh, appointed uh, a gentleman by the name of Nick Callio to be the head of the Legislative Affairs Department. And uh, Nick and I actually worked together in the first Bush administration uh, for, uh, when, uh, with Bush 41. And, uh, you know, Nick said, well, a couple things. Number one, we've got, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a pretty big legislative agenda that I'm going to have to, to focus on. Uh, the budget, no child left behind, the, 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 the tax legislation that they wanted to push through, that was gonna, they were going to really make a, you know, a big push there in the first six months. Number two, since it was a transition from a Democratic administration to a Republican administration, there were literally no uh, 
political appointees in place, much of like we're facing today. So the normal people that would kind of um, shepherd nominees through the process uh, weren't, uh, weren't there anymore. And uh, I had worked on the transition and, and worked on the, uh, uh, the Senate confirmation for, uh, for Bob Zellick, who was the USTR uh, representative, uh, and, and also for the Secretary of, of Labor, uh, uh, which uh, kind of went through a couple hiccups, too, if you, if you remember. So um, I had had a little bit of experience in that regard and also in the Legislative Affairs Office in the White House for Bush 41. So Nick said, would you come in and, and kind of help us coordinate all the, the sub-cabinet um, uh, people as they go through the confirmation process. I mean, we have a lot of these people that, you know, they're told, okay, you're being nominated to be the Assistant Secretary of Labor or the Assistant Secretary of Treasury or the Deputy Secretary of Defense or whatever. They've never had any experience in that regard before. Uh, they don't know uh, how to do courtesy calls or who, what committees to see or what to say or what not to say. So I kind of walk them through that whole process. My job was to kind of develop a template that I could work with all these nominees and, and kind of um, some were on autopilot, some were a little bit more, you know, problematic than, than others. Some had a lot of questions, some had no questions at all. But my job was to kind of be the coordinator for that whole process until we got enough assistant secretaries for legislative affairs at all these departments confirmed, uh, which was in about June or July of 2001, where as new people came online, then they, they could kind of uh, take, the, take the job there. So um, <clears throat> my very position, I guess, the fact that they needed somebody full-time to just handle the Senate confirmation process was in and of itself maybe a reflection of the new challenges that were faced in, in this position. Uh, Calvin McKenzie wrote a great book uh, a number of years ago uh, uh, called Innocent Till Nominated. Some of you may have heard it or read, it, read about it, uh, where he has a line in there which I love. Uh, it says the confirmation process is nasty, brutish, and not so short. And uh, that's exactly kind of what I found through the process. I was telling Sarah before we started, you know, I, I guess I would kind of sum up, you know, this, this grand constitutional role that we, the Senate has of advice and consent that, you know, I, I said, I, I think I got a lot of advice and not a lot of consent uh, during, the, during the process. But it was, uh, it was, it was challenging, and uh, I learned a lot about um, uh, how this, this process works now. Um, a couple points uh, uh, about it that I would just highlight. Um, number one, I, I think, uh, <clears throat> uh, and when Sarah, I, I had the privilege of reading Sarah's paper before the, the uh, the session today, and I think a lot of the things that she's going to tell you about the process and the reason that a number of these uh, judgeships uh, nominations and confirm confirmations have been slowed down are, are very much true at the sub-cabinet level, too. The, the, the greater uh, polarization in the Congress and, uh, and ideologic ideological divisions between the, between the parties and, and things like that just make it a, a lot harder. The other thing that, that I noticed, uh, and, and I think this is kind of a maybe changing norms inside the Senate that <clears throat> they many times they kind of treat nominees like they do uh, a piece of legislation uh, and uh, no, it's a piece of legislation um, they they um, you know there, there's a lot of log rolling involved that you know I'm gonna kind of you know stop this nominee unless you know you give me this or that uh, and uh, and things like that so um, I think the other thing is that it used to be maybe um, not okay to oppose a nominee on policy grounds. That you know, it used to be that well, you know, if they were a you know a tax cheat or or did you know something something else that was uh, that was bad, you might be able to oppose them. But you couldn't just say, well, I'm a you know I'm a liberal and he's a conservative, or I'm a conservative and she's a liberal, so I'm gonna. I'm going to oppose them. That, that's kind of changed, too. I think you see a lot of people just opposing peop, uh, people based on their, on their policy views. So um, as a result of, of my experience, I, I, I wrote a paper which was in uh, the PS, the, uh, the journal that the American Political Science Association or one of their journals does, uh, and I, I called it Postcards from Sisyphus what I saw during the confirmation wars. We've and, made uh, that available to all of our guests here, and it's also, I, I hope to get it up on the website if I get permission with PS, but uh, go ahead. But I, I was just going to say there were, there were just uh, <clears throat> about five different quick points that I want to make that, that I think were, were pretty common through this process that, that I think uh, 
uh, s summed it up very well. I, I said that um, senators will, um, you know, typically engage uh, in, in one of the, the kind of the five deadly sins of, uh, of, of being involved in the nomination or confirmation process. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll kind of go through each of them real briefly. The, and I, I named them. They all started with A's, but I used a little bit of journalistic uh, license here because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, that, that they, they, all the titles fit, but I think you'll get what I mean. You know, the first one I called avarice, you know, getting something from the process. And as I mentioned that before, there's a lot of, you know, um, I'm going to put a hold on this nominee because I want to get a letter from the administration, you know, supporting my bill, or I'm having problems back in my district with a regional office, and I need to get. So, you know, you, there, there's a, a lot of that log rolling and, and, and give and take that would go on in the process that had absolutely nothing to do with the nominee or their qualifications or anything, but you'd see a lot of that that would go on and kind of wade through that, that process with people. Um, the second point I, I, I called angling, uh, fishing for the politics of personal destruction. And uh, basically what I, what I meant by that was that lots of times I, I found that p particularly if, if people had very different policy views with, with someone, they could, um, what, what they said, kind of bloody them up a little bit during the process and then uh, by, by bringing up things about their personal past or, or whatever that would um, maybe not preclude them from getting confirmed but it might make them a little bit more ineffective down the road uh, when they were um, when, when they were eventually in their positions. Um, the <clears throat> the third one I called afterthoughts, uh, victims of collateral damage, and this was an interesting one because um, you know a, <clears throat> a lot of the focus on what's happened in the confirmation process and why it's become slower and more difficult has to do with kind of interparty. Differences that you know the parties have 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 gotten more dif different in terms of their ideological views, or there's more polarization. Um, in this, in the particular case that I talk about in the paper, it was really um, an issue within the Republican Party. We had four nominees for the Treasury Department at very high levels: the Under Secretary, uh, General Counsel, and two Assistant Secretaries, who were all very talented people, all very competent people. Uh, and uh, but were all held up by um, then Senator Jesse Helms, who um, was in a big fight with the Treasury Department over a textile issue, and it actually went back to the Clinton administration and some issues that um, and and agreements that he thought he had f from the from the uh, from the Treasury Department about how certain textiles were going to be classified, but um, the. The new administration, in his view, kind of reneged on, on those, uh, those commitments. And as a result of that, no nominee for the Treasury Department was allowed, allowed through. He held a hold, hold on all of them. And he was one of, you know, pres he was in President Bush's party. But yet for five months, we had four or five people that were held up uh, over an issue that had nothing to do with them but all, all to do with a, a textile issue where um, he felt the Treasury didn't... Um, Treat them the right way. The fourth one I say is antipathy or, or payback time. There were several people who, again, um, were, were maybe served in the Reagan administration or the first Bush administration and had some run-ins with people on the Hill. Uh, there was one gentleman who was very controversial at the time, a guy, a guy by the name of Otto Reich, who was um, a, uh, some of you may have heard of or remember, was I think an ambassador of Columbia and had some other positions, and uh, he, was, uh, he was nominated to be Assistant Secretary uh, of State for Latin American Affairs, and he'd had a number of run-ins with Senator Dodd over the years, and uh, they were just giving him a very hard time about, about getting, getting through, um, and a lot of it you know, had to do with um, the, the, the problems that, that he had when he had served in a previous administration. The, <clears throat> the final one I called um, apathy. Uh, haven't got time for the nominee, and uh, th this may have been one of the the the, the, the biggest ones that uh, is is kind of unsung in this in this whole process, and it's just that um, you know senators are very busy people, and uh, they've they've you know they focus on their legislative agenda and the and the issues that they're they're um, 
uh, that, that they are concerned about. Um, you know, keep in mind, a lot of, you know, all these positions I'm talking about, even, you know, Assistant Secretary of State for, for I mean, Assistant Secretary for, you know, Public Affairs at the Small Business Administration, um, you know, they have to go through the Senate confirmation process. They have to do courtesy calls. They have to have a hearing if the if the senator uh, if the chairman wants to do it, uh, and uh, you know that can just take a lot of time. And sometimes just getting people to focus on a nominee that that they don't consider um, you know all that important uh, uh, slows down the process. We we were I was always very grateful uh, working with Senator Kennedy's staff actually because he was one of the few. Uh, senators who uh, basically told us, you know, I'm not going to waste my time doing a hearing on a nominee that's pretty non-controversial. So he would, he was pretty good at helping us expedite things through the through the help committee, uh, in particular, uh, and the and the judiciary committee, particularly if um, if he didn't think it was something that uh, you know really required a big dog and pony show. So. Um, Anyway, that, those were kind of my, my five deadly sins, uh, and, uh, and I'll, I think I'll stop there and turn it over to, uh, to Sarah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Jim? Well, <clears throat> first, uh, uh, to get the history precise, because uh, I think a lot about history when I talk about this subject. Uh, I arrived on the Hill the first time in January of 1967. Uh, I left in July of 1973, and then I came back almost 30 years uh, to the month, uh, or to the year, to the year in uh, 2003, and stayed until uh, 2006. So I saw two very different slices of uh, the confirmation process and the Senate and the relationship between uh, the Senate uh, and uh, the executive branch. Um, I always have to count, because I forget, during those two periods of time, I worked on 13 Supreme Court nominations. Mm -hmm. That may be a, a record, I don't know. Um, and uh, they were uh, quite varied in, in the uh, dynamics uh, of them. But there was one rock-solid uh, principle that really carried through both periods of time, and I think is perhaps the most important dimension of, of this discussion. And that is that uh, people in the Senate take their role as senators and take the Senate's role as an important part of the balance of powers extremely seriously. Uh, if you go back and read the history of, of the Constitutional Convention and the discussions that surrounded the Constitutional Convention, it jumps out at you that the founders thought that they needed to invent the Senate because uh, they were a little worried about the presidency and they were a little worried about the House as, as being too political with a small p, too uh, reflective of the ebbs and flows of popular uh, opinion. And therefore, uh, they gave the Senate uh, very particular powers and very particular uh, structure. Obviously, only two per state. So it's a small body, very supposed to be very uh, collegial. Terms of six years, three times what the House got and longer uh, than a president uh, gets at a time from an election. And of course, they're not all elected at once. The members are divided up into three classes so that it's a continuing body. Two-thirds of the Senate always remains in office after uh, each election. And they thought that would provide more stability and maturity uh, uh, through continuity. And they gave the Senate very special uh, powers, um, among which uh, were approval of treaties, and the one we're discussing today, uh, advice and consent on appointments, both within the executive branch and the judicial branch. Now, the judicial branch appointment discussion during the Constitutional Convention uh, took very interesting terms, turns. Uh, they tried out different ways of 
uh, appointing judges, and actually the president was not even part of it for most of the alternatives uh, they considered. I have to say I haven't gone back and, and looked at the details for a while, but as I recall, there were five different variations on how they were going to pick judges, and the president really didn't uh, come into his major uh, role in that until uh, the last uh, iteration. At some points, the Senate was going to do the whole job, and where they finally came out, uh, almost as an afterthought, was that this would be a shared responsibility between the president and the Senate. They did not trust the president to do this uh, himself. They didn't think of it as himself or herself in those days. We would have to say himself or herself. Uh, and they did not uh, ultimately want to give it exclusively to the Senate. They thought of it as a uh, joint uh, operation. And the words they picked, very terse, as is the case with most of the Constitution, two parts of it, advice and consent. Now, that part of it, that, that advice part of it, uh, sometimes has risen in importance, sometimes has disappeared, but it really has become, I think, over the past uh, decade, a more impar important part of it, and I'll get back to that later when I discuss the future, because I think you will see uh, more uh, advice. The institutional uh, force of the Senate's role not only on uh, judicial nominations and other nominations, but across the board as uh, the calming influence on the political uh, branches um, is something that, that senators learn about either before they get to the Senate or after. Now, the way some people learn about it before the, they uh, get to the Senate is that they are, in all the cases I know of right now, the sons of senators. They've lived with the Senate uh, all their life. Mark Pryor was the son of a, a Senate. He ended up as one of the gang of 14, which I'll come back to in a, in a minute. Uh, Chris Dodd was a son of the Senate. So some of them really, uh, uh, when uh, Albert Gore was in the Senate, he was the, the son of a senator. So some of them come by it very honestly and, and deeply. Uh, some of them learn it when they get to the Senate. Uh, I think probably Senator Kennedy uh, did not have, was not imbued with that particular viewpoint when he came to the Senate as a, as a young man in 1962. His brother had been, uh, his older brother had been senator briefly, but probably not quite long enough to get the, the full flavor of it. Um, but over the years, he has, has grown into one of the great uh, Senate uh, institutionalists. Um, others that you think of immediately are Bobby Byrd, the person who's been in the Senate longest, and on the Republican side, uh, John Warner of Virginia, who just uh, left the Senate. Um, these are people who feel something special about the Senate. You can, for example, go look at the Shivo debate uh, on the Senate floor, in which a time, a day on which they passed the Shivo legislation, uh, on Palm Sunday. There really was nobody on the Senate floor at the time, but they nevertheless passed the Shiva le uh, legislation, had a wonderful colloquy between Senator Frist and Senator Levin, even though Senator Levin was in Detroit at the time, and that colloquy became the basis on which the courts ultimately decided uh, the Shiva case. I mention it because in the middle of, of this uh, holiday, is a statement from Senator Warner about the institutional role of the Senate and his feelings about it and how he thinks the Senate's performance on the Shivo case perhaps was not consistent with that, in, uh, that uh, institutional role. I can't be sure whether he gave it in person or not. I think he probably did. I think he probably came in on Palm Sunday uh, just to give that. When the idea of changing the filibuster rules, changing the cloture rules, uh, began to be bandied about again, and I say again because, of course, it had been a very hot topic uh, all during the 50s, 50s and 60s when you could not get a civil rights bill uh, 
through the Senate because it would be filibustered by uh, mostly the Southern Democrats and some uh, uh, Republicans from all over the country. There were too many uh, Southern Republicans then. Uh, so there were constant discussions during that period of changing the cloture rules, the cutting off of, of debate, uh, because you could not get a civil rights bill through because you could not get uh, cloture at that time. It required two-thirds uh, of those present and voting uh, to cut it off. And uh, that rule was changed um, actually after the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 was passed. That, that bill was passed uh, with the full two-thirds majority closing uh, debate, largely because of the bipartisanship I wouldn't even call it bipartisanship, the recognition by the Republican uh, leader, Everett Dirksen, that civil rights was, as he said, quoting, what was he quoting? The strongest thing in the world is an idea whose time has come. It's a great quote, but I keep forgetting who said it. And uh, Dirksen quoted that on the floor, and the civil rights bill passed with uh, a, a two-thirds cloture vote uh, preceding it. Well, once it was changed to uh, three-fifths, that is 60 instead of 67 in the 100 senator Senate, uh, then it was pretty calm for a while until we got to 2003, and uh, uh, the Republicans were very upset that they were not able to get cloture on some of the judges uh, they wanted to get, and they threatened to change the cloture rule. And at first it started in the regular course of things, that is, a bill was introduced for a change in the rules, uh, and it went before the Rules Committee for a hearing. People testified for it, against it. It was all very calm <coughs> and uh, gentlemanly and ladylike. But um, then uh, <coughs> Senator uh, Frist threatened to take a shortcut and <coughs> Uh, change the rules without following the rules. That is, to get a majority vote of the Senate to change the rules, even though it still required two-thirds vote of the Senate to close debate on a rules change. And that was the so-called uh, nuclear option. Now, about that time, a uh, wonderful book uh, came out uh, called The Master of the Senate uh, by Robert Caro. <clears throat> and um, uh, it's just a wonderful portrait of the Senate during Lyndon Johnson's uh, times, and of course the focus is on Lyndon Johnson's uh, role in the Senate, first as a young senator and uh, eventually as uh, majority leader himself. And um, the issue seemed so institutional and so important that Robert Caro, who had become a, a, a really uh, self-educated expert on the Senate, he, he was not a historian as such, uh, not a lawyer. He was a journalist. He started out on the Long Island uh, Newsday. Newsday. Right. And he was a very good reporter and then be became a his historian. I think Master of the Senate was the third volume in what's supposed to be five. Um, uh, about Lyndon Johnson, but he had absorbed this sense of the Senate. The book starts off with Bob Caro sitting on the Senate floor and asking the attendants to turn out the lights so that he could get the feeling of what the Senate was like in the old days before the TV lights, before any lights were, were there. Uh, I don't know whether they lit candles for him or not, but that, that's the way the book starts because he wanted to imbue himself with the feeling of the Senate. So Bob Caro came down, and uh, he was invited by um, a, a, I forget whether it was a single senator or a group of senators. I believe all the senators were invited. My recollection is that nobody came from the Republican side, but a lot of Democrats came, including some, some brand new uh, senators. This was in the spring of uh, 03, so there were several new senators. And he talked about the great senators of the past, the role they had played in the country, the way the Senate's deliberative process uh, 
largely aided by the lack of a cloture vote in those days. There was no way to close off debate until the 20th century, and then when the cloture rule was first passed, it didn't even apply to nominations. But Bob Caro came down and spoke to this group of senators and staff and, and brought alive this tradition of the Senate of debate and careful consideration and respect for one another. And he said to the senators and the staff, he said, you don't have the right to give away the powers you have been given. They are not yours. You hold them in trust. It's a direct trust from the founders, which you are the temp temporary trustees of, and you can't give away this power. And it was a dramatic moment. People who were there remember it very uh, vividly. And I believe that uh, had the nuclear option been brought to a vote, I'm probably in the minority, um, that it would have failed, that the Senate would not have taken a shortcut in violation of the Senate rules to change the Senate rules, and especially to change the rule that ensures that there will be a fulsome uh, debate in the Senate. Now, that makes the Senate a hard place sometimes to get something done. Um, it's always easier to stop something in the Senate than to get something going in the Senate. Uh, but I would say uh, that the system isn't that broken, that if you look at it over a long enough period of time, and, you know, I, I'm not ancient, but I've been here a lot of that uh, time uh, since, um, uh, say, Everett Dirksen, you see that it works pretty well. Uh, when I got to the Senate in 1967, uh, the first uh, uh, nomination was uh, Thurgood Marshall's. And that was somewhat controversial, and I think some people opposed it. I think they'd given him a little bit harder time when he's nominated to the Second Circuit, but he had been Solicitor General uh, in the meanwhile, but everybody understood that this was a great thing for the court and a great thing for the country, for the man who had been the most successful civil rights litigator uh, to become a member of the Supreme Court. But that glow and my virginal exposure to the uh, confirmation process disappeared quickly when Lin Lyndon Johnson tried to make um, his friend Abe Fortas uh, Chief Justice of the United States. And at that time, the Republicans filibustered. Uh, they, they made that uh, issue go to a cloture vote. Cloture failed. And if you look at the cloture vote, you see that it was totally nonpartisan. Uh, because of the makeup of the Senate then, uh, the people who voted together were the Southern Democrats, and the less moderate Republicans, on the one hand, in that case voting uh, against cloture and voting for cloture, the um, more liberal Republicans and most of the non-Southern uh, Democrats. And that's the way it was in those days. Nothing was partisan. You could not get anything done on a partisan vote except organizing the Senate. So you decided who was chairman and who wasn't chairman. But on any other vote, you had to get people from the other side. So just to give two last examples of, of the system working in those days, uh, one was uh, the uh, replacement uh, for a vacancy in 1969 originally. And the first uh, nominee was uh, a man from the Fourth Circuit named Clement Hainsworth, and his uh, nomination was rejected, and it was rejected uh, by a vote of 55 to 41, and of those 55, um, 38 were Democrats and 17 were Republicans. That was a typical vote in those days because just because he was a Nixon appointee did not mean that all the Republicans had to vote for him. And 17 of him, including several members of the Senate's Republican leadership at that time, 
uh, voted against him. Well, that left the vacancy, and uh, Richard Nixon, advised by his Attorney General, John Mitchell, and I think there's an actual quote from John Mitchell saying this, uh, decided he was going to rub the Senate's nose in it, in what they had done. And they said the Senate can never turn down two Supreme Court nominations in a row. And so he nominated uh, a man named G. Harold Carswell. Uh, to shorten the story a bit, the denouement of that nomination came when one of his advocates, Roman Frosca of Nebraska, said, oh, well, people say he's mediocre, but there are a lot of people who are mediocre in this country, and they deserve representation on the Supreme Court. And one that of the great was the of all time. Yeah. Huh? one of the great quotes of all time. Yeah. Yes, and that was uh, uh, that resulted in the defeat of Carswell again by a similar vote, uh, 51 to 45, with 38 Democrats and 13 Republicans uh, <clears throat> voting against him. Just to give one example of an executive branch nomination working very well, then uh, there was an acting Attorney General. Uh, in early 1972 named Richard Kleindienst, and uh, uh, he succeeded uh, John Mitchell, who went back to uh, CREEP, that's one of our favorite acronyms, uh, Committee to Reelect the President. And uh, so uh, Kleindienst was acting Attorney General, and Nixon uh, finally nominated him to be Attorney General, and he went through his hearing in the Judiciary Committee, and it went pretty smoothly, even though there was a great deal of, of uh, Democratic opposition because of his history back in Arizona. Uh, but he got through the Judiciary Committee, uh, probably with the votes of uh, the Southern Democrats and all the Republicans. Uh, and uh, the day after he was reported, a uh, columnist named Jack Anderson uh, published a column containing a memo indicating that $400,000 had changed hands in, during uh, Kleinding's acting attorney generalship from uh, a company called IT&T to the Republican Party uh, in order to wash out a series of antitrust cases against uh, IT&T. And Richard Kleinding, you have to love him for this, went to the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, James Eastland of uh, Mississippi, an unreconstructed Southern racist, and said, I want to defend my good name. I want you to reopen the hearings. And Jim Eastland was a wonderful guy, and, and you know we all got along very well with him in those days, even though he didn't um, agree, we didn't agree with him on anything. But he said, Dick, are you sure you want to open, reopen this here? He said, I want to defend myself. I've been accused of dire things here. I want to reopen the hearing. And Eastland said, all right, you want to reopen the hearing? You will reopen the hearing. Well, Eastland was the fairest chairman in the, in the Senate, and so we gave him a list of 50 witnesses we wanted. And um, he called a good many of them over the course of an additional hearing that lasted 22 days of hearing. Now, I don't think there's been a 22-day hearing since then. But the system, by the way, he, he got confirmed, and uh, uh, we got very close. There's a very thick hearing report with a pullout of, of all of the uh, facts uh, of the case. Um, in the course of his testimony, he was asked whether he had ever spoken to the president about the ITT antitrust case, and he said no. As a result, when the Nixon capes, tapes came out, and there was a transcript uh, in which Richard Nixon said, uh, Dick, uh, could you please wash out this ITT case? And Dick said, oh, but our antitrust division thinks it's a great case. He said, Dick, we need to stop that case. And he said, well, let me send you a memo about what a good case is. And the president said, Dick, I'm ordering you to wash out the antitrust case against ITT. Well, when that transcript came out, he was uh, the subject of a criminal information to which he pleaded no low to. So we didn't quite get him in the, in the uh, I don't know which of your A's that, that uh, fits under. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't have much experience with the A's as you see them. In my case, I see them usually having a good side, and here's an example. We almost uh, 
prevented a man who shouldn't have been attorney general from becoming attorney general, but we didn't succeed. But in those days, you could get a really good hearing and get to the substance of real uh, allegations. So um, I think the uh, system worked pretty well then. I don't think it works quite as well now, not because people are too tough on the um, nominees, but are not tough enough. And I'll get back to that All right. later. Thank you, Jim. I, I don't know whether it was Thoreau that said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. It seems to me it was. But my favorite quote from Dirksen at the same time was reporters asked him after he changed his mind you know, on the 64 Civil Rights Bill, uh, Senator Dirksen, how do you explain this? Before you said it was unconstitutional, and then you turned around and voted for it. He said, well, I am a man of principle, and one of my first principles is flexibility. And so that was my favorite Dirksen quote. But uh, with that, I'll turn things over to uh, Sarah Bender. Great. Um, thanks very much to Don uh, for including me today. I have to admit it's always uh, a little daunting, and especially so today, uh, when my final fellow panelists have far deeper and more intricate knowledge and experience hands-on uh, about the politics and the practice of advice and consent. So I view this for me as learning f uh, mostly from all of you. Um, in addition, then I want to ask and answer hopefully uh, two different uh, questions here. First, I want to sort of step back and try to provide a, a sort of longer term, uh, broader perspective on what might be driving conflict over judicial nominations and how can we explain the rise of conflict over these mostly courts of appeals nominees. And second, I want to figure out a little bit, how can we use what we know about the past to speculate a little bit about what might happen uh, or what might lay ahead for President Obama's uh, lower court judicial uh, nominations. So uh, just to show some trends here, these are confirmation rates from the 80th Congress, 1947, through the last uh, Congress that just ended in 08. The blue line are the trial courts, the U.S. District Courts. The red line here are confirmation rates for the nominees to the U.S. Courts of Appeals. Uh, and clearly, the trends kind of jump uh, out at you. Uh, first of all, fairly quiet, but not uh, entirely so before, uh, the before the 1970s there. And then uh, a sort of a rapid uh, fall off. Uh, the bottom drops out of the confirmation process in a way uh, during the Clinton and the Bush II uh, administrations. The blue line, you might think, well, the trial court nominees fare a little bit better, but I think what's striking to me is that their fate may be catching up uh, with what's been experienced by courts of appeals nominees, at least in terms of the level of conflict that, that results in these lower rates, of, uh, lower rates of confirmation. So we may be entering a new phase where even the trial court nominees uh, are not immune from uh, confirmation conflict. Um, second, when we talk about confirmation conflict, usually we have in mind these uh, rates of uh, failure or confirmation rates over time, but the other way to think about it uh, is actually variation across the courts of appeals here. So uh, the zero court of appeals, that's the D.C. circuit. Um, bad graphing there. And here I'm looking at failure rates between 1991 uh, and last year. So for each of the courts of appeals, for all the nominations made to that court over that uh, almost 20-year uh, period, uh, what percent uh, failed to be confirmed? And clearly is a big, pretty large degree of variation where some circuits are quite successful. The Second Circuit, uh, mostly around New York, part of New England. The Seventh and Eighth Circuit moving uh, into the Midwest and uh, Mountain region, pretty successful with their nominees versus what's been uh, going on, particularly uh, the D.C. Circuit, the Fourth, uh, particularly the Sixth Circuit, Midwestern Circuit, which has been the, the res uh, topic of uh, much, uh, much uh, coverage about the almost dysfunction of the court and dysfunction of the confirmation process for those seats. Uh, so clearly there are some courts where there's really uh, not a lot of conflict and some which are quite, uh, quite having, a, having a tough time with it. And then third, the question of how long it takes to uh, work through the confirmation process for judicial nominations uh, without making a judgment, I guess, of whether that's good or <laughs> bad. In fact, we might want to see longer uh, confirmation processes if it means we're digging deeper into the pros and cons of putting particular nominees onto the bench for lifetime appointments. But our general sense that things are dragging out longer certainly uh, is confirmed by those uh, those types of data. That's for the courts of appeals. And again, uh, just to give you a sense here, so this is the last Congress. This is the average confirmed nominee here. So let's say 150 days or five months uh, on average, uh, and that's for the ones who actually do get confirmed. Uh, 
oddly enough, despite because we don't hear a lot about it, it's the trial court nominees who are also uh, experience increases here. Granted, the, the scale is different here, uh, but the average one, the last Congress is about say 125 days, so not that much, not that much shorter. So uh, I guess the question is, well, why? How do we account for this variation in the Senate's treatment of nominees, both over time and across the circuits? Uh, in the paper, I suggest that the conventional explanations we have don't necessarily get us very far. And just briefly on what those conventional explanations would say, one explanation says, well, there's sort of nothing new under the sun. The process has always been political. I think it's hard to look at the confirmation rates and the drop-off uh, in recent decades uh, and to say that there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, the second explanation is typically sometimes we think of it as the Big Bang. Something happened and judicial nominations changed uh, thereafter. Something happened that changed senators' attitudes about judges and about nominees. I argue in the paper, well, I'm not quite so sure about uh, this explanation. As I talk about uh, in a moment, there's something has to do with the changing nature of the lower federal courts and the types of uh, d issues that they are asked, uh, and types of questions they're asked to uh, arbitrate over. But it can't just be the role of the Warren Court uh, because we see confirmation uh, conflict not until the 70s and 80s when the court presumably begins its big push into more tough issues with 1954 Brown versus Board of Education. Other folks say it's the Bork nomination for the Supreme Court in 1987, uh, and then after that, everything falls apart. My sense has always been that the Bork nomination might be more a symptom than a cause uh, of the problem. And of course, as uh, Gary's uh, comments pointed out today, all right, neither of the court, these court-centered explanations can really account for why we also see the rise of conflict over executive branch nominees in the late 80s and into the early uh, 1990s as well as 2000. So if it's not the Big Bang, uh, and if it's not uh, enough, just the old same old story, what is it? I suggest in the paper that there are sort of different baskets of confirmation uh, conflict causes, and we should think of terms of both the incentives uh, to scrutinize nominees as well as senators' institutional capacity to do it effectively. So I, I'll just say just briefly about the first basket of issues here, ideological conflict, uh, partisan incentives, electoral incentives, and then just very briefly about institutional forces as well. Why might the political incentives or policy incentives here matter? I argue in the paper we need to think a little bit about the rise of ideological polarization between the parties in the Senate and also about the merge and since the 1960s of the federal courts as much more central players uh, in the construction of public policy. First, briefly on the courts, beginning in the 50s and 60s, we see a new exercise of judicial power across a whole host of policy issues. When we talk about the rights revolution of the Warren Court, we are also talking about the transformation of the federal, of the lower federal courts, and particularly the courts of appeals. So when the Supreme Court expands constitutional rights of individuals in civil rights, uh, voting rights, abortion, education, criminal procedures, the lower federal courts are those which are entrusted with finding remedies to enforce these new rights. So courts of appeals judges starting in the 60s become really um, active policymakers, if you will, in issues related to civil rights, health, safety, the environment, regulation of business, and of course questions of abortion and crime. As one uh, court scholar has called it, the courts become, quote, the fodder for electoral politics. Not surprisingly, then, given the changing nature of the courts, who sits on these courts uh, likely became much more important uh, to presidents uh, in selecting nominees as well as to senators called on to confirm them. And of course, uh, to interest groups who may be, uh, on, in fact, on the forefront of driving these very changes in the nature of the court's uh, agenda in the first place. So at a, I think at a very basic level, we probably can't understand the rise of conflict over judicial selection if we don't take account first of that transformation in the nature of the courts over this long post-war period. But of course, in a period of transforming or changing courts, if the parties are not terribly distinct ideologically, or in a period where there's, as uh, we were talking about, right, a cohort of conservative Democrats as well as more uh, moderate, I guess we used to call them liberal Republicans. We don't really call them that anymore. We didn't uh, call them conservative <laughs> they're, they're, Democrats. Okay. We thought they were pretty radical. <laughs> okay. But in a period where the two parties aren't really polarized, there may not be a large incentive to gang up uh, within your party to keep the president's judicial nominees off the bench. Even if you're in the opposition party, there's a good chance the president's nominees may be uh, acceptable to you.
and uh, this is a little uh, tangent we might come back to, it, it may be that in a period where there's a large uh, sort of center of, of senatorial opinion that there's more tolerance for the other party's uh, nominees as opposed to today where there seems to be a lot less uh, tolerance for the nominees that are suggested. But uh, it's very different, I think, in a period of polarized parties when the parties are at odds with very few senators between them to mediate. Uh, it's a very different story. At, at that point, it seems that there's an incentive for the opposition party to the president to better scrutinize the president's nominees and at times uh, to prevent a confirmation, but not, but not always, of course. So as polarization increases and as the courts and judges become more salient to the political parties and to senators, I'm not surprised then to see it take much longer to confirm nominees, longer for presidents to come up with nominees, and thus the, the, the possibility of rejection uh, to become more, uh, more likely. So ideological forces seem to matter in explaining the uh, trends in judicial selection. It, it strikes me that purely more partisan uh, forces matter as well. There's a there's this certain uh, tit for tat that you can hear listening uh, to senators. Senator Cornyn uh, said very recently, he said, when Democrats basically, as in his words, stop confirming uh, Bush nominees in the run-up to the presidential election, uh, he went on to say that what goes around comes around. When the shoe is on the other foot, there is going to be a temptation to respond in kind. Now, I think political scientists, we think senators think this way, and we dream that we're going to find them, catch them saying that, uh, but they rarely actually say things quite, uh, quite so pointedly. But I, I think the increasing salience of the courts, the uh, growth of, the, of ideological differences between the political parties and the rising of partisanship that really does not necessarily, or rather, that reflects more than ideological differences, that these political and policy forces are combustible and they are discouraging perhaps tolerance of the other party's nominees. They may encourage presidents to appoint uh, less mainstream nominees, uh, but it's, they certainly seem to add up to give incentors, uh, senators an incentive to scrutinize nominees much more carefully. Uh, on the issue of institutional forces, I like to think that these political or ideological incentives or partisan incentives are enough to encourage senators uh, to scrutinize nominees, but incentives aren't enough. You also need the capacity to act on those uh, intentions. And as the argue in the paper, the capacity to derail nominees or to scrutinize them depends on the rules and the practices of advice and consent. And those rules and practices tend to distribute uh, power pretty widely across the Senate. So if we want to explain uh, patterns in judicial selection, I think we need to know more about the institutional context in which advice and consent takes place. And without detailing them uh, too much here, there are multiple potential uh, veto points, clearly in committee, uh, where the practice of the blue slip potentially allows a home state senator to block nominees slated for a, a judgeship within their state. Uh, the behavior and the views of the committee chairman matter here on whether and when to go ahead, whether to respect the blue slip from an opposition party nominee. Uh, the institutional sort of choke point of getting on, getting a nomination onto the floor, getting into executive session, you need the support of the majority leader. That is not always so easy to do in a period of divided government. Uh, the majority leader may need uh, to confront holds uh, within his own uh, political party not let alone during a unified control when he uh, would have to uh, anticipate holds from the, the opposition party. And of course, finally, uh, getting to a vote, the opponent uh, opponents may force you uh, to get to 60 votes. So what we do in the paper is throw a lot of variables together to try to explain the trends, uh, confirmation trends. And sparing us uh, the statistics, this is just sort of boiled down to what appear to be important forces in, in driving down or predicting uh, confirmation failure here. First of all, uh, if these forces do matter, we should expect to see some of these uh, trends. First, in periods of divided government, that should depress the likelihood of confirmation. Again, because the majority leader controls going into executive session, so in period of divided government, that may be a choke point that can keep nominations from confirmation, or opposition party senators may be placing holds. So divided government, it turns out, drives down confirmation rates. I talk in the paper about the particular balance of Democratic and Republican appointees sitting on the particular courts of appeals, and it turns out uh, I was sort of surprised to, f to actually find empirical evidence of it, but that circuits which are closely balanced, say the Sixth Circuit between Democratic and Republican appointees, 
those nominations are much more like much less likely to be confirmed relative to nominations from other courts. If a nomination is made to a court that's not evenly balanced, uh, say the Eighth Circuit, heavily Republican circuit, right, there, there may be less of an incentive to slow down the works uh, because you know that nomination uh, is much harder to make a difference on the court, on the court of appeals, not least because these judges work in three-judge uh, three panels. Uh, the degree of partisan polarization seems to matter. In Congresses with higher polarization, confirmation rates are worse or lower. Uh, we can look at what happens with uh, home state senators who idol have ideological differences but with the president. Uh, those seem to drive down confirmation rates. And one of the strongest trends here in years of presidential elections, confirmation rates, we know they slow down, uh, and that uh, holds across the whole 60-year period. And that's, to me, is some sort of evidence of the presidential or the partisan tit for tat, right? You want to save those vacancies for a president of your own party uh, to, to make uh, once they may regain the White House. So. Uh, and finally, we can actually control for at least using what the ABA thinks of as the ratings of the quality of the nominees. Uh, and once we control for that, in addition to all these political, other political factors, it seems uh, that it matters uh, not so much. Um, and in part because there are relatively few nominees who are rated poorly by, by the ABA. So where does that leave us? What is ahead for Obama's judicial nominations? I think there are a couple questions we need to ask and we would need answers to to really know how well uh, the sledding will go for Obama nominees as well as the potential for the president to make an impact uh, or to put his own imprint onto the federal, particularly the federal courts of appeals. We would want to know who will retire uh, my hunch is we'll see a steady wave of retirements, particularly from, I think it's roughly about 20 federal judges who were appointed by President Carter, who, as best I could tell, uh, despite their uh, long-term uh, service on the courts, they did not seem eager to retire when a Republican was in the White House. And I suspect that many of those will, uh, judges will now uh, seek a retirement, if not senior status. Um, second, there's been uh, a sort of subtle, I think, almost two decades stalemate over the expansion of the federal bench to keep up with rising caseloads uh, across the courts. It's possible that we'll see Congress and the judiciary uh, move to see some motion toward an omnibus judges bill later in Obama's term, and that, of course, uh, as Carter had and as Reagan had, creates grand opportunities to put, uh, from Obama's perspective, his imprint onto the federal, onto the federal courts. The caveat here is I've never been convinced that uh, expansion of the courts is the highest priority for the judicial conference. At the moment, the uh, high priority seems to be about raising judicial pay, uh, as they say, to uh, ensure better to recruit, uh, recruit and retain uh, quality judges. But both of those factors, retirements and expansion, would uh, matter for the for Obama's uh, potential here. Uh, th third, the potential of unified party control is pretty clear given the analysis of the last uh, 60, uh, 60 years. So Obama would clearly have the wind at his back to having control of the Senate. I think the lesson for, uh, that I take from the analysis, though, is that unified party control is not a magic or silver billet. Polarization remains high. Republicans will fight nominees, I think, that are slotted for balanced courts if they disagree with their policy views. Home state senators will still have a blue slip, although Senator Leahy, as chair of the committee, has said he's unlikely to acknowledge or respect anonymous holds. Uh, but in short, it seems to me that the, the heat of confirmation uh, may go down uh, quite a bit, but it's not uh, going to go out. And having said that, much will depend on uh, the nature of uh, President Obama's nominees themselves. The paper ends up with a little discussion of congressional reform. Uh, this is taken from the 1920s or so. This, uh, I've always been uh, perplexed by Smedley Butler, who in 1940 apparently was the most decorated mar Marine of his time, and he was also a Quaker. I've never really known uh, what to do with those two. Uh, it shows his conversation with Dawes, uh, Coolidge's uh, VP, who had come into the vice presidency and really excoriated the Senate uh, for not reforming itself. Uh, and Dawes is saying here, General, maybe the Marines can do it, but I couldn't. Um, I, I don't want to think then I, your experience is more valuable here uh, than my reading of, the, the, of what in the, the past here. I don't want to uh, be overly optimistic about the potential for reforming the Senate. I understand it is exceedingly difficult. And what I do in the paper is to try to lay out some potential, hopefully more uh, pragmatic reforms that possibly could occur, although I'm I sort of doubtful. Uh, 
I, I think probably the strongest reform that has some potential is something uh, that we refer to as selection commissions, the idea that one or two of the senators would set up a so basically a nominating commission at the state level, either on a partisan basis or a bipartisan basis, whereby basically state uh, legal elites are, and some political elites are involved in generating names that could then be forwarded to the White House for selection. Uh, there's some limited, I have a little, little bit of empirical evidence to su suggest that in fact, states that use commissions, those nominations to vacancies in those states tend to uh, fare better. Um, but it's only limited evidence. I suggest in the paper that perhaps we need to think about some sort of hybrid solution where the president, were he to select a nomination or nominee from a, a list that had been recommended at the state level, perhaps that nominee would be afforded some sort of fast track, uh, fast track uh, protection. That is, that there would essentially be uh, no, no filibusters allowed. Were the president to select a nominee who was not recommended at the state level, then that fast track protection would not be afforded. Um, I think that might be uh, achieved without changing actually the formal rules of the Senate, which I think is impossible. Uh, so it may be that some sort of creative thinking about how to how to harness presidents' incentives and senators' incentives perhaps uh, might uh, might put reform on a on a more optimistic path. But I'm going to stop right there. Thank you very much. Just a quick question in here. You mentioned uh, the ABA ratings. I know when uh, Bush uh, two came in. Alberta Gonzalez uh, sent a letter, he's then consul, White House consul, sent a letter to the ABA saying we don't want your ratings. Uh, were those still done, whoops, were those still done for, for the benefit of the Senate? Uh, they were? And I assume that uh, the Obama White House probably does want those, those ratings, but uh, find out. Well, let's turn things over to uh, David Kirkpatrick with the New York Times. Well, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, I, I'm a little bit out of place here because it's it would be, I think, inappropriate of me to talk uh, it was specifically about proposals for reform, but I can talk a little bit about, about my own experience covering some of these confirmations. Um, uh, in, in fact, just to make things interesting, I'll, I'll start out with a story, of, uh, Mr. Flew will be interested in this, that I, you don't usually hear from reporters, and maybe I shouldn't even be telling. Uh, long after, uh, I, I, I've covered the nominations of uh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, and Harriet Myers and Justice Alito uh, for the Times. Long after that was over, I went out for a drink with a Republican operative who was involved at the White House in their uh, sort of quarterbacking of those of those nominations at the time. And we had never met face to face. And he 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 greeted me warmly, more warmly than I expected. <laughs> and as a you know as a reporter, there are two kinds of responses from the subject of a story that you don't like. They love it or they hate it, and both feel terrible. Uh, and I and I was so I was immediately suspicious. <laughs> why was this gentleman so pleased to see me? And uh, he let me in on something. Uh, he he there was a there was a an, an issue. Uh, what seemed to me at the time to be um, kind of a low level issue uh, with the Alito Alito uh, nomination, uh, and I covered it as kind of a low-level issue. It, it gets into the nitty-gritty, but to, to, but to tell the story, I've got to explain it to you. And Mr. Flug will remember it well. Uh, uh, Justice Alito, uh, when he was on a lower court, when he was on an appeals court, uh, when he was confirmed for that position, he made a number of, of quite expansive statements about preventing any conflict of interest, he, things he would do that he would recuse himself from. One of those things was he said he would recuse himself from any case involving the company that managed his mutual funds, Vanguard. Uh, uh, it, it, now, he doesn't have any personal interest in Vanguard. Vanguard manages his mutual funds. His, his money, his interest is in the assets that are held by the mutual fund in which he's invested. So he, he really had gone above and beyond. And, and his Vanguard holdings were quite diversified. I mean, it's, you know, it's an S&P fund. It was a peripheral thing, but he, he went quite far. Uh, in this, in, in this uh, promise at the time of his confirmation to the appeals court. I won't hear any cases that have to do with Vanguard. Uh, I, I'm told, or I later learned, that the, the, new, the circuit, the, the appeals court that he was involved in, has a computer that tracks recusal pledges by the justices and will steer the assignment of cases away from them if they've made a recusal pledge. So uh, it happens that uh, 
Judge Alito, when he was on the, on the appeals court, uh, sat on the decision about whether or not to hear a case involving Vanguard, the management company of his mutual funds. He shouldn't have done that because he had pledged that he wouldn't. Uh, but they said that the, the, the people involved in the court, uh, Democrats and Republicans alike, said, look, this was a computer glitch. You know, the computer should have taken care of enforcing that for him. It was a small oversight on his part. Um, uh, but he was right to expect that the computer would take care of managing the allocation process so that he wouldn't be sitting on any quick cases that violated his recusal pledge. So fast forward to his nomination to the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm covering the matter, and uh, Mr. Flug was, was uh, back in the game. Having left the Senate, he had come back uh, to work for Senator Kennedy in anticipation of some vacancies in the Supreme Court, I presume. And his, and his return, <laughs> see, seeing as he was, he was involved in the defeat, the uh, landmark defeats of Clement Haysworth and uh, Harold Carswell, his return uh, struck fear into the hearts of Republicans and conservative partisans everywhere. He was, it, was, uh, it was a great deal of uh, anxiety about his presence um, back on Team Kennedy. Uh, so uh, this comes to light. This comes to the attention of the Democrats, that there was this case that Alito uh, uh, sat on, uh, one of the, the uh, he decided, you know, he, so he, he heard the appeal from someone who wanted to sue Vanguard, and he said, no, you don't have a case here, goodbye. Uh, this person who wanted to sue Vanguard came back and said, aha, you, uh, Mr. Alito, have uh, a pledge not to hear such cases. And he said, oh, how right you are, let's have it reheard again by another panel, same decision, the case doesn't get heard. Um, so the, the Democrats got hold of this fact. This fact came to light in the vetting of Mr. Alito and, and sought to make a big deal out of this. Now, I'm a reporter, right? And, and I believe that, uh, that our readers want us to be a notch more than stenographers. They want us to do some work in shorting out what's, sorting out what's totally specious from what merits their attention as readers. Um, so here comes the Democrats saying, uh, this is a disaster. How could he have heard this Vanguard case? And the Republicans saying, well, come on, it's a glitch where there's no conflict here. Big deal. Um, in my view, uh, it, was, you know, it's, it was a touchy question because on the one hand, yeah, he made a promise in a confirmation hearing, and then it turns out that he didn't follow it as you might expect. He had broken his word. Now here he is making other promises about how he's going to uh, evaluate the law impartially and look out only for the public interest. You know, okay, that's a problem. On the other hand, it was a little bit of a dog uh, that didn't bark in the night because it didn't make any difference to the outcome. He didn't actually have any interest in Vanguard. And uh, it seemed quite credible to me that this was a small, uh, a small transgression, a small glitch that he readily corrected. Um, so uh, I covered it as such. I covered it as a small matter. Other papers covered it in a bigger way. I covered it as kind of a small way. And we are the New York Times. And that's, I think, important. Um, uh, so. Uh, it, it, and all of this is going to be especially interesting to Mr. Flug because I believe you were among the um, the proponents of the Vanguard case. And I, I have to say, I felt a certain amount of chagrin. I felt uh, uh, because he, he, I, I still believe I was right. It was it's a minor matter. I mean, I don't think the American public, if they really understood this now, think, "Oh my gosh, what have we done? This man who heard the Vanguard case is sitting on the Supreme Court." Uh, but both the White House and Jim Flug, in their independent assessments from both sides of the aisle, believed that this was an issue that had political power. Uh, and then and I, I learned something from that. I mean, I, I, I can still sleep at night, and I think I probably did the right thing in the way I covered it, because I don't think it was that big an issue, and it was appropriate to, to let it out. And, and if people wanted to go crazy with it, they could. Um, but it was, it was telling to me, partly because it's, it, it, it points out some of the uh, perversity and irony involved in the way that we now uh, manage court confirmation, Supreme Court nominations. I mean, the people who loved Alito and the people who hated him loved him or hated him for reasons that had nothing to do with Vanguard. You know, I, I don't think anybody, he's not a guy who has a lot of assets. He'd never been in the private sector. His life is not rife with conflicts of interest. Uh, people cared about Alito because they cared about abortion, because they cared about tort law, because they cared about uh, civil liberties or the prosecution of criminals because they cared about executive power and the war on terror. Uh, those were big issues. Um, but I the world we live in, it, 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 it's, 
just as just as Professor Bonner discussed, I mean, there's there there have been these changes, uh, changes in the activism of the court, the involvement of court in a, in a broader array of issues that have dovetailed with increasing uh, ideological division on both sides, and they, the two go hand in hand. I mean, the court gets involved more, and that in in civil rights or in prayer in the schools or in abortion rights, and the court's decisions have in turn. Uh, catalyzed a reorientation of the parties so that the two parties have more ideological consistency within each party and difference between them, uh, and that in turn uh, politicizes the court more. So there's a kind of a feedback loop here. So here we are in a world where we have interest groups on both sides that have been uh, preparing, raising money, agitating in anticipation of the Supreme Court confirmation for a long time. And I'm thinking now of the emails that I still get, even to this day, from People for the American Way, the, the liberal interest group that's so involved in many of these cases. A and their emails lately say, don't rest. The religious right is still alive. Just because Falwell is gone and Dobson uh, has retired, you know, you, we cannot rest easy. They are still alive and plotting to take over the court. I mean, that sort of thing is churned out constantly on both sides to keep people agitated <laughs> and contributing. Um, and it creates this kind of hydraulic pressure on both sides. Uh, and, and these two forces flow in towards the Senate, which, as we've just discussed, is a sort of Byzantine maze of power and procedure. And, and as they flow in, they get redirected all different kinds of ways. And so we, we have these conversations which, uh, although we all know they're about abortion and uh, tort law, look like they're about uh, uh, the payment of taxes or somebody's nanny or well, this promise about Vanguard. Um, and it is, when you watch it up close, you really see that it is, it is kind of a crazy, nutty way to go about uh, processing these things. But uh, especially having heard my fellow panelists, I mean, the, the, the truth is that w what we're talking about here is the United States Senate. Uh, there is no sort of small tweaking to the rules of Senate confirmation procedures, which will be a cure-all, because it is the Senate. The Senate, for, for, you know, for better or worse, was built to be a very difficult place to get things done. Power is widely distributed by design, and one senator or two senators uh, can gum up the works in all different kinds of ways. And saying, all right, we're not going to, no more blue slips. The re blue slips uh, are a, an outgrowth of the dispersion of Senate power. I mean, there, you know, if, you, if, if, a sen if a home state senator wants to make it difficult for the executive branch, he or she can make it difficult for the executive branch. And that's just, that's, that's just the way it's going to be. So unless we're talking about really a wholesale uh, revision of Senate procedures or a return to days when there were, there were intra-party ideological divisions so that there wasn't so much inter-party ideological division, uh, I'm not sure there's an easy fix for all of these. But I would say, and I'm trying to keep my remarks uh, brief and concise here because so much has already been said, I would add, though, on this note, having covered these Supreme Court uh, confirmations, um, they are not without value. Uh, they are a heck of a lot of fun to cover, and I think they are also uh, worthwhile for the American public to observe uh, in a way that is a little bit like elections, but in some ways deeper because of the nature of our constitutional democracy. Supreme Court nominations are when we debate uh, first principles. They're when we look back over uh, the decisions that have shaped American society over the last 50 years and we start to ask ourselves, you know, what do we really think about uh, racial justice and racial integration? What do we really think about, you know, sexual liberty and uh, reproductive rights or uh, prayer and the schools or God and man or our relationship with each other and what's, you know, when, where is privacy in the home? And, and, uh, and we, we revisit, you know, uh, the, the Truman Steel cases. So, we, we, you know, we, we go back over these things, and there, there's, there's an instructive aspect to it. People learn a lot from these debates. So they have to sort through a certain amount of, you know, what movies was Clarence Thomas renting at the video store, or what did, what was, uh, uh, what did Justice Alito say about Vanguard, or what about this Princeton alumni group that he was involved in. But they also get, in the, in the debates are riveting. People pay attention. They pay a heck of a lot of attention. And uh, the end result, I think, is not so bad. I mean, so, some money is wasted. Uh, interest groups on both sides raise a lot of money that, in the end, probably goes for naught. Uh, 
Um, but I, I, I think, like Mr. Flug was saying, I think the, the Senate was designed to make uh, confirmation difficult. And you know, we, we only need to fill nine seats in the Supreme Court. Surely, uh, uh, the President of the United States is able to find uh, nine individuals, if he needs, who can be qualified, competent judges up to the task and get through the maze. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. Um, uh, and if there were another Supreme Court nomination, I would be raising my hand to cover it right away. Thank you very much. Let me do a follow-up question on that, and uh, that is, Gary, you have helped prepare nominees for confirmation hearings. Is I get the impression the advice from the administration usually is, don't commit yourself on any issues. And I've noticed that the, the most recent uh, cabinet uh, nominees and so on, even where they've taken a position in the past, maybe as a member of Congress, they will not say anything about that issue. Is that the general advice that's given, just because you want to preserve the administration's ability or flexibility uh, to make a later decision on that? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's right. I mean, the, um, when we're talking about executive branch nominees, the, uh, the advice uh, typically is to, you know, to stay pretty general on things, and that, always, that creates you know, some problems with the, with the senators. Um, the, w the one thing that um, uh, I, I think people miss sometimes in this process is that you know the the public's window on a lot of these things tends to be the confirmation hearing. Th there's a lot of stuff that goes on you know well be before that, including uh, courtesy calls and you know meetings and with with, with individual members uh, information that's transmitted to the Senate and, th and things like that so there, there's a there's a lot of information in that regard um, and a lot of times when you watch a confirmation hearing you'll you'll hear a senator say something like you know well as you and I were talking about in my office or, or something something like that so it's a lot of the stuff that comes up um, is is not really a surprise in in that regard, but but yeah, I think you you try to uh, to keep people at a pretty general level if uh, if possible. And you know the one of the, the the people on the Republican side of the aisle who um, some of you may know or have heard of, who's who's handled a lot of no nominees, is a is a gentleman by the name of Tom Corlogus who goes all the way back and worked in the in the Nixon and Ford administrations in legislative affairs and. You know, one of the pieces of advice he gives nominees is that you know, oftentimes in these processes, it's it's really more about the senators than it is about the nominees. So he, he tells them, you know, just look, kind of listen to what they have to say, and 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 they want to you know maybe get something off their chest or they want to make a point or whatever, and and uh, so that that's kind of his his advice, and 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 you see that play itself out a lot. I ran Jim? across <coughs> a wonderful quote this morning uh, from none other than John G. Roberts. Uh, in 1981, so how long ago is that? Is that microphone there, uh, 1981, quote from John G. Roberts when he was inside the Reagan administration, and he's talking about the approach to uh, confirmation proceedings. He said, the approach was to avoid giving specific responses to any direct questions on legal issues likely to come before the court, but demonstrating in the response a firm command. <laughs> he also <laughs> said in the same... Uh, no, it's a, it's a different memo around the same time. Uh, the proposition that the only way senators can ascertain a nominee's views is through questions on specific cases should be rejected. If nominees will lie concerning their philosophy, they will lie in response to specific questions as well. Now, that's a very important quote going back to the Alito situation. Um, David and I have not had a chance to discuss this since the confirmation. I thought I was going to have to defend my, my performance on the CAP uh, uh, situation, the concerned alumni of, of uh, Princeton, because David was the expert on that subject. Uh, he had gone through all the documents at a time we could not get the documents, and when we finally got the documents, um, I, I'm sure he felt that we didn't need to look at them because he had already looked at them. Well, we, that's another story. I don't, but, you know, I welcome everyone looking at the cap documents. But, it, but it was, in uh, any event, on on the other issue uh, on Vanguard, um, it wasn't just about whether 
uh, his economic interest is important or not. The question was one, an institutional one for the Judiciary Committee, I thought, I'll speak personally for myself, uh, and I believe uh, my then boss said this uh, in public. Uh, the question was, had he been candid with the committee back when he was placed on the earlier court, as you said, uh, did he stick to his commitment to the committee? But more importantly, in his courtesy visits, and he visited every member of the committee, each time he would come out of a courtesy visit with at least the Democrats, because they were the only ones interested in this subject, they would recite a different explanation for the Vanguard case. And, but all of them, as David just said, depended on the assumption that he had put Vanguard on his recusal list and that the court or its system or its computer had screwed up and that's why he had sat on the case. Well, it was pulling teeth to get to the bottom of that situation, but as it turned out, he had never put Vanguard on his recusal list and all the different stories that he gave in these uh, private interviews were based on something that was not a matter of fact. So it was more serious than it seemed, but I have to say uh, those of us uh, uh, who were working on it probably did not do a good enough job. If we could not communicate that nexus between something important and something superficial to the New York Times, then, then we didn't do a good job. And, um, you know, maybe we should feel embarrassed about that. Um, hey, Don, one, one other point I want to make about the questioning of nominees that I think is important for you all to, to recognize is that looking at this process in broadest terms, you have to recognize that things range all the way from these, you know, very complicated you know, or, or policy, legal kinds of questions or, or, uh, that people are asked about to something, you know, very, very simple. We, we had one nominee that, that, that had, in his confirmation hearing, spoke two words, and that was all, the, all the, that he did. He was at, this was back in the first Bush administration, and Fritz Holling, Senator Hollings from, from South Carolina, was asking uh, a nominee for the Commerce Department why Commerce Department grant announcements always went to the senior senator from South Carolina and not f to, to Senator Hollings. It would be Strom Thurmond at the Strom time. Thurman. Yeah. And he said, why do they always go to the senior senator? Senator Hollings? He said, can you give me your word that in one time in the next four years, I'll find out before Strom Thurmond does? And the nominee's response was, you bet. And he said, you're, you're reporting to the Senate. <laughs> so they, they, they range from the, you know, from the very complicated to things like that, too. Well, I, I remember on the Clarence Thomas uh, confirmation hearings, they asked him whether he had ever discussed Roe v. Wade with, uh, with anyone, and he said no, and everybody was incredulous. But uh, then the story was going around that he, Clarence Thomas thought Roe v. Wade were two ways to get across the Potomac. But um, <laughs> terrible, I know. <laughs> Here's a uh, quote from a 20th Century Fund uh, study back in 1996, and I just want to get uh, reactions as, uh, on this as to whether things have changed since then. There are too many questions, too many forms, too many clearances and investigations and hearings. The appointment process is too slow because it is too cumbersome and redundant. Uh, it is repellent to potential appointees and abusive to those nominated because it is so often unnecessarily intrusive and humiliating. Simplicity, clarify, clarity, and focused sense of public interest have vanished from the appointment process. I get the impression, Jim, from what you said, that you thought that things weren't tougher now and that there was maybe less scrutiny. Do you take issue with that? Have things gotten better or worse no, uh, since uh, those days? On that count, th there's no doubt that it's tougher now than it was 35 years ago. Um, you did not have emails and you did not have electronic uh, uh, retrieval of documents. I mean, the documents that we had on both Alito and Roberts were incredible. We knew everything there was to know about those people, and it was well, not everything. Yeah, except for the cap files. Except for the yeah. cap files, which we eventually got, but it was very late in the game. But um, it was uh, tremendously hard work to go through them, but, you know, a lot of lawyers are, are trained to do that, and newspaper reporters too. Uh, and um, some of it was, was very uh, revealing because you learned what, made this person uh, tick uh, 
when he was younger in these two cases, and then you can decide for yourself whether that was still uh, what was uh, making him tick. On the other hand, the questionnaires, the, the redundant questionnaires, the duplicative questionnaires, the, the detail, apparently, I, I haven't actually read the 62-page questionnaire, but w one of the questionnaires, uh, if you've been divorced, and it doesn't matter how long ago you've been divorced, it then goes on to ask, in very specific terms, apparently a checklist of what the co the causes of, of the divorce were. Um, you know, it seems to me that, that that may go, especially if it's far enough back, uh, too deeply into uh, things that, that are probably not relevant. If there's some reason to believe that something in that sphere is relevant, well, you can ask about it. But to make that a routine question seems to me overly uh, intrusive, and I'm afraid that it, it has uh, gotten that way and um, that it is, that's worse than it was. David? If I, yeah, if I could add two other comments in the, under the rubric of the strangeness and perversity of the system. Uh, from the perspective of a journalist, the structure of a, a judicial confirmation where the, a Senate committee is conducting its own investigation has access to an FBI report, has much broader resources than any news organization in some ways. It, it creates the atmosphere of a treasure hunt. There is a there is a, a a suspicion, a fear that there's some little nugget lurking behind closed doors in all of this information that has been gleaned through these extraordinarily intrusive questionnaires and interviews, that some of the news organization is going to get first, um, and it and it and that's, I mean that's just a fact of life, and you know we're nobody's going to make anything up, but it is a bizarre uh, experience to be to be part of it, um, uh, and the other corollary to that is that this the increased scrutiny and the politicization of the hearings and the process um, selects for people who have said or done little in their lives. You know, the, we joked about uh, Chief Justice Roberts that he had been stolen from the crib and raised to be a Supreme Court judge because he had, aside from his work for the Reagan administration, where he was really working for the Reagan administration and you couldn't hold him that accountable for his views beyond wanting to work for the Reagan administration, he ha had so meticulously avoided uh, uh, any opinion, really. I mean, it was very hard to pin. I'm sure you experienced this. It was wor worse than that because he had uh, apparently had lunch with every liberal Democrat in town at least once a month. Now, how he kept his weight yeah. that way, he must have eaten at least three lunches a day. I mean, he really was on a campaign to get to know everybody in town, especially uh, the Liberal Democrats, and he did a very, very good job of it. Yeah, without speaking a public word about his how he felt about the sort of uh, uh, metaphysical status of a fetus or anything like that. I mean, Alito was less clean. Alito, you could discern, even in the memos that he wrote working for the Reagan administration, you could discern in his rhetoric uh, his, his passions. You could sort of see where he was coming from, uh, which made him a trickier confirmation. But you, uh, just from those two examples, as well as the Harriet Myers example, you can see that the process, in, as, it, as it grows more and more contentious, it, it, it selects for people who have said little, and that may not be to the public good. How does the Harriet Myers example well, give she, that lesson? Well, she, uh, she, again, I think, was appealing to the Bush administration because uh, in her work as a private attorney, Bush's private attorney, um, she had left very little paper trail. Um, she was again, this is a funny moment, um, she was undone in part, I mean, there were a lot of reasons for her undoing, but there was a, a, set, a speech she did give once, a long, long time ago, to some rinky-dink state group, but it was transcribed, and she touched on the subject of abortion. And uh, this was an example of me losing the treasure hunt, because uh, the Washington Post got to this before I did. Uh, and they ran it as, you know, Harriet Myers gave a speech supporting abortion rights. The truth is the speech didn't actually support abortion rights. The alarming thing was that it was so incoherent it made you really doubt the intellect of the author. <laughs> um, but it was a long time ago. But it was a long time ago, right. But, um, I, mean, I mean, the ironic thing is that when Har Har Harriet Myers, Myers was named or even uh, talked about uh, being, being named for a few days, um, those of us who, who didn't know much about her did a zero-based, a vet on her to the best we could. 
and you know we were getting some very interesting without any speeches or anything else just in terms of her personal relationships uh, back home and how she was thought of by the bar and by the uh, people in the government down there and she was having a good vet when they pulled the plug on her. Oh, you mean she was coming along okay? Yeah. Well, which probably is the reason they pulled the plug on her. Uh, that if, if she was okay by our standards, then they, they probably <laughs> decided they didn't want her. And of course, that goes directly to the question of securing advice. Uh, you remember that, that uh, at some point the White House said it was going to really do the advice thing. So um, Andy Card and other people from the White House called around to the whole Judiciary Committee and to a lot of the Democratic senators and said, okay, we're asking for your advice. Well, everybody knew that if you su suggested a serious candidate who they might possibly nominate, that support from most of the Democrats on the Judiciary Committee would be the kiss of death. They would figure that that's got to be the wrong person. If, if we could live with them. I mean, that's how political we perceive it as, as being uh, on the other side. So we suggested some very, very good people, but people whom they probably could never appoint anyway, so we weren't doing anybody in. But for example, uh, uh, somebody suggested the Chief Justice of the Vermont, the former Chief Justice, or maybe he was still Chief Justice of the Vermont Supreme Court, died in the wool Republican. I think he had headed the Bush Sr. Uh, uh, Vermont uh, uh, campaign, excellent judge, um, and- uh, He happened to be 80 years old, right? No, oh, he okay. was not. He was fairly <laughs> young. He had one small problem. He had written the opinion in which the Vermont Supreme Court endorsed gay marriage. Well, he obviously was not going to go anywhere, but he would be a very good Republican appointee that everybody could agree on if he could get past the White House. So the advice thing, and I hope we get a chance to get this, is very spotty because if the president's going to take advice seriously, then he has to say to the people he's going to for advice, uh, I want your serious advice and I'm going to take it seriously of course you have to pick people who are within my range of comfort, but whom you would also be comfortable with. It doesn't do any good if they're only comfortable in your range, but I wouldn't be comfortable with them. I'm not going to nominate somebody like that. And the idea is to get to uh, a comfort level on both sides. And presidents know how to do this. The Bush White House did a very good job of that, I think, at least the part of the elephant we saw, on district court nominations, for example, they would run the list of names they were considering by the Democrats who were interested in the, the Democrats in a, in a particular state. And if there were responses and reactions, they would pay attention to them. And I don't think they would have uh, uh, selected, we didn't know at the time who they were going to select, but I don't think they would have select, selected somebody for a district court vacancy if there had been a strong reasoned antagonism or sense that, that that person was not capable of doing the job, would not be respected by a broad swath of the bar, would not uh, get the job of the court done. If, if there were substantive reasons why a Democratic senator thought this was a bad appointment, I think the Bush White House would have accepted it at the district court level, but not at the circuit court or the Supreme Court. Uh, Gary Andrews has to leave in about five minutes, so let's open it up for questions and maybe give him the first uh, crack at an answer before uh, he has to run. But I want to thank you very much for, for being here, Gary. Uh, let's flip strum. Let's go with you. Please identify yourself and uh, your affiliation. Thank you. I'm Philippa Strum. I'm a senior scholar at the center. Uh, thank you very much. It was, it was really interesting. I have uh, two questions for the panel, the first one for the whole panel, the second one for Mr. Kirkpatrick and perhaps the rest of the panel. First question is, to what extent do interest groups influence the process or do they at this point just cancel each other out? Um, the second question is, I guess this is a comment as much as a question, I'm not as sure as you are that there's a great national discussion, great national dialogue when people are nominated to the Supreme Court I mean, you think back, for example, to Justice O'Connor being nominated. 
and the question was all about had she or had she not or why did she or why did she not um, endorse abortion while she was a legislator in Arizona. It was not a discussion about abortion or about what policy towards abortion should be. Same thing with Justice Ginsburg. When she was nominated, there was a, an outcry by some of the women's groups that she said that Roe v. Wade should not have been decided by the court and that the matter should have been left for the states. That did not become a matter of discussion. That would have made for a good national dialogue. When Alito was nominated, there was a whole question about cap, whatever, but not a discussion about, and, and it was a matter of finger pointing. He said this or she said that as a person before he or she was nominated to the Supreme Court, not, well, let's really look at the issue that he or she was talking about. So I wonder whether one might not rethink that national dialogue well, thing. I would, let's, I mean, let's go to the first question first, because I want to give Gary a crack, and then we'll get to the, her second part, if that's all right. Uh, and that is on the influence of interest groups. Gary, you've seen it with Bush 1 and Bush 2, and, and since, is there, is there a change, or is it about the same? A uh, um, couple things. I, I think, number one, I think overall interest groups have, have become more important in the process just because there's more of them now. I think there's, if you look at the process over a long period of time, it, the you know, kind of the you know, Washington establishment has kind of grown, and, and I think there is more role. Now, do they, you know, do, do they really you know, sway senators' votes and things like that? Um, you know, again, I, I'm not sure that, that they do that much in that regard, but I think they kind of create an environment that um, will, number one, you know, will either give senators, you know, cover or some heartburn about things. And, and I think to the broader public, you know, to your point about a broader national dialogue, sometimes, especially on these bigger uh, nominations, um, I think they can, they can kind of, you know, bleed out into the popular culture then and kind of give, give people a sense of, you know, this is like really controversial or this guy's really radical or this guy, you know, this woman is, is you know, bad, bad news or, and kind of s set that, help set that stage and be kind of an, an echo chamber in that way. So I, I think they are important uh, because there's more of them and, and, and then the way they kind of bleed out into the, to the culture. The last point is I, I think that, um, you know, y y you have to make a distinction between the kinds of uh, uh, nominations you're talking about here. You know, there's a lot of the ones that I worked on that the interest groups, you know, didn't really get involved in or care about, um, but there, there were some that they, they did and, and they can have a little bit of an impact. So. Sarah, your finding was that they didn't particularly have a decisive influence. Is that correct? Um, thank yeah, you, Gary. Um, we can Please join me in uh, thanking Gary Anderson. <laughs> uh, just briefly, I mean, we can throw into these models the involvement of interest groups and their, I understand the limits of doing this in a quantitative sense, but if we were to put into our model that for each uh, nomination how many uh, interest groups on the liberal or opponent, uh, conservative side testified uh, against the nomination and then we ran it with all these other variables, it turns out that the effect of interest group involvement kind of washes out, which is somewhat dissent of what Gary was saying. Um, part of the problem is that we see a, a sort of an increase in interest group involvement uh, in recent years at the exact same time when polarization is rising, and uh, there's, an in there, right, there's a feedback effect between, between those two. It's not quite clear which is the chicken and the egg and which was making the difference. So when we run the, the data this way, it looks like the interest groups are really more a reflection of the uh, conflict than, than they really are driving it in any independent sense. Jim, is that your take on it pretty much? or? It varies from okay, the help or hindrance to, the, to you well, at the staff level. There are some interest groups who, for example, as we sit here today, are doing very detailed readings of all of the circuit court judges whom Obama might consider uh, appointing. And they want to know everything there is about uh, that person on both sides. There, there are groups on both sides doing that, and they will get up a dossier of 30, 40, or 50 uh, judges with all the opinions they've ever written, all the articles they've ever written, and their take on that record. That will be useful to a senator who does not have the staff or the inclination to, to get his or her staff to do it themselves. Now, for the members of the Judiciary Committee, they read the outside group's uh, take on it uh, when it's given to them but they also go ahead and do it themselves, as, as David will testify. Even if the New York Times has been through a box of documents, we want to go through it ourselves. So um, 
in that sense, they, they play an important function. On the other hand, a lot of it is just fundraising. You're right in the middle of either Roberts or Alito, uh, Bob Novak wrote a column based on a fundraising letter sent by four people, none of whom I knew, uh, led by Ed Meese, I might have sh sh shaken hands with him one time, attacking me um, for reasons I still can't understand, but that they thought was going to raise funds. Well, of course, if you get attacked by Bob Novak and you work for a liberal Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee, that's a cause for high fives all around. It's the yeah. greatest thing that ever happened to me. But somehow, you know, that's what they thought they ought to be doing, and and uh, you know, so some of it's kind of bizarre, and and it is uh, used for just blatant uh, fundraising purposes. So as a reporter, Dave, you probably get bombarded by things from interest groups directly. Uh, I take it. Yeah, I mean, you know, every you get bombarded by everybody. You get you get you know BS and spin of all kinds from all quarters. It's sort of constant incoming, but it's. Uh, you know, there is one observation that I uh, might add. There's a, there's, in my experience of these three nominations, there was an asymmetry between the interest groups of the left and the right. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly why. But the, the liberal interest groups would meet in Senate offices with Democratic senators. The conservative interest groups met across town and worried about what the Republican senators were doing. Now, uh, that may be just that the, the left is sort of more mature. Um, it may also be that the right feels burned by the Supreme Court nomination process. A lot of them, of the judges, the justices that have, that have been the most troublesome for them were Republican appointees, uh, black men, not black men, O'Connor, others. Um, uh, Stevens, I think, also was a Republican. Suter, right. Yeah, right. So it's a long, so there, when you, hear, when you mention Supreme Court nominee to a Christian conservative, for example, they are immediately suspicious that they're about to be sold a bill of goods. But it, made, it makes for, it was notable. It was notable that the, that the uh, Democratic leadership seemed so much um, in better communication and coordination with the interest groups of the left than the Republican leadership did with uh, interest groups of the right. And I don't know whether that makes the right more or less vital or more or less powerful, but you certainly saw that play out in the Harry Myers case where the shelling was coming from the right on the, on the Myers nomination. Um, on your other question about uh, the, the uh, quality of the discourse, uh, or that surra the public discourse that surrounds Supreme Court confirmations, uh, two things. First of all, I wrote some articles about uh, uh, Judge Alito, Justice Alito's writings on abortion when he was in the Reagan nomination and his opinions about how certain cases the Reagan administration, his opinions about how certain cases uh, on abortion should be argued or shouldn't be argued for the Solicitor General. So that stuff was covered. But the bigger point is I just think we need to keep in mind the baseline of American public discourse. You know, it's true that there is a lot of bogus stuff that gets tossed around when we're talking about Supreme Court confirmations, but that's against a baseline of a largely bogus culture. You know, people, the people tune in to debate Supreme Court confirmations who are watching One Life to Live uh, other times. Do you know what I mean? And it's sort of, it's sort of I, that, that would be the only caveat. I think also the, the judicial nominations have uh, more of a curiosity factor for people because it's one of the rare glimpses they get at the bench of people that have served on the bench that are being nominated for, for a higher place or whatever because once they're on the Supreme Court you don't have television. Very rarely do they have you know, audio tapes available and that's, that's changing a bit. But uh, yeah, I mean it feels like, it feels to me from observing that what, poli what gets people excited, interest groups, observers, people on the Hill, about appeals court and district nominations is that they're, they're, the, they're the tail of the Supreme Court fight. This is, the, this is the, uh, the bench from which a Republican or Democratic president will pick. And, it's, and there's a kind of hostage game. You know, the, the interest groups are rehearsing their, their strategies and people are holding back each other's nominees, you know. But all of it is a kind of proxy fight for the, for the, big, the big one. But it's going to be interesting to see the, the next nomination because there'll probably be six new news channels uh, trying to, to cover it, and um, and all the bloggers will now have live video Facebook stuff along with their blogs, and it's going to be a whole new ball game. But it is sometimes um, interesting, and it is sometimes good entertainment. 
I mean, if you were watching the, the day, the, the key day in the Alito hearing, uh, when two things happened, when Senator Kennedy got into a fight with Senator Specter over that box of documents that yeah. David had seen and we hadn't, um, and, you know, Specter uh, kind of made a mistake by saying he hadn't denied us the documents when, in fact, he had, and Senator Kennedy got a little bit excited about it. Well, Fox News thought that was the greatest thing ever. They went on and on and on with that. And even after the hearing ended at lunchtime and, and we were standing around resolving the issue because uh, Specter staff told him that he had, in fact, denied us the documents and he immediately <laughs> apologized and got us the documents. And Fox stayed on and they were analyzing this and analyzing this and analyzing this and, and naming all the players on, on the, uh, that, who were still on the, the rostrum. And then they brought their commentators in to comment on what the effect of the, the uh, dispute between Kennedy and Specter had been. They also opined at that point that that was a turning point and that Alito was in trouble. So I've heard this now from three different places that the White House was... Well, I didn't... No, no, no. The Vanguard thing is what I was talking I didn't bring up the cap. No, thing. no. But, I mean, th I've heard th three different ways now uh, that some public and some private that they were really worried about the Alito nomination. Oh, the Alito nomination. Yeah. Well, yeah. The Alito nomination was a much tougher nomination than the Roberts nomination. I mean, th there was a lot... Uh, yeah. But, in fact, um, uh, that was the day that as soon as that particular lunch break was over, Lindsey Graham came back and said to uh, Justice Alito, uh, or then Judge Alito, um, uh, you know, people are trying to make out like you're a closet racist. You're not a closet racist, are you? And, of course, Judge Alito said no. And it was at that point that Mrs. Alito, who had kept the exact same look on her face until that moment, the whole time she had been there, uh, burst into tears and left the room. Well, that started a whole new round <laughs> of speculation on Facebook of, uh, and, and the blogs and everything else about whether uh, this was some kind of planned uh, event. I mean, that was that, and that took away from the whole debate that had gone on uh, that morning and that Fox News had uh, thought was so important. Um, Do we, I mean, let's, we've, we we're having this conversation about uh, Alito's involvement in this Princeton alumni group. We ought to let them in a little bit on what the alumni group was. Sure. For people who, for people who don't remember, Alito uh, became a member of uh, Concerned Alumni of Princeton, also my alma mater, which was a uh, reactionary, I think is a fair term, group formed by uh, conservative uh, Princeton alumni who were upset about the admission of women to the school, affirmative action. Uh, and all the changes to the school and its culture that came with uh, women and people of color on the campus, as well as some sort of related changes to the social architecture of the place that were designed to make it more democratic, small d, and less elitist. So Alito signed on to this, and I, and I um, the papers of this group were uh, controlled by one of the trustees of the National Review, who I happen to know, so I managed to get in to see them in advance of you guys. And I, I poured over them I mean, it was sort of well known that this group was somewhat inflammatory. And I poured over them for evidence that Alito had done anything more than write a check to the group and was unable to find it. But you left but out one fact. Alito had bragged about his membership in the group in applying for a job with the... Reagan administration. He listed it. Reagan but I had reported that in the Times. Right. The no, Times. no, they had reported. That's yeah. why it was important. He had thought it was important enough to put on his resume, and he described it as concerned alumni uh, of Princeton, a conservative organization, to show his bona fides for that administration. That's what, what uh, yeah. made it so important. Then, somewhere along the line, he completely forgot about it. And why that is important, footnote on history, is that there was one famous Princeton alumnus who had denounced this organization. Remind me who that was. It's you were obviously not at Princeton at the time. I'm trying to remember. I mean, it's they're, they're the most famous Princeton alumnus. There's lots of not famous Princeton. Woodrow Wilson, but he's dead. A, a sports figure. <laughs> Bill Bradley. <laughs> Bill Bradley. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. Bill Bradley denounced it. Bill right. Bradley denounced the uh, publicly denounced this organization. So every Princeton alumnus that I was able to find knew all about the organization 
knew about Bill Bradley's denunciation about it, but Samuel Alito somehow between uh, whatever date it was that he joined and the time that he became U.S. Attorney and Bill Bradley was sitting introducing him in the Senate and apparently he didn't put that on his U.S. Attorney um, uh, application. So there was, again, some question about selective memory, if you will, and um, that's why it was more than just a gotcha. It was really a question of, of his uh, credibility and his uh, uh, candor, again, with the same Judiciary Committee that he'd had the the uh, Vanguard problem. If I could just add that. Sir, I had a, okay, go ahead. Sir, I had a follow-up comment, and then I want to get to more questions if we could. I'm just going to very, very, very quickly. Um, I, I wonder about this question about the political, the, the public's impact, right? Does the public care about these nominations? Uh, is there any harm done by this type of conflict over the nominations? Or if there isn't, and that's another sort of force towards saying we should be more encouraging of it, um, it it's actually uh, hard to, to know whether or not the, the public how they react to these particularly lower court cases. So I did a little survey experiment, which is to take an internet survey where I have a thousand people, and I basically expose, I divide them in, randomly into different groups, and I expose them to different scenarios. And essentially, I vary, are you told it's a George Bush nomination or is it a Bill Clinton nomination? And then I vary the confirmation vote. Is it a contested 53 to 47 or is it unanimous vote? So you're basically, I won't run through all of them, but just an example here, Federal Judge Ralph Jones was appointed to the bench by President George Bush, confirmed Senate 5347 vote after a contentious three-year battle. And then we can vary what the other groups heard, uh, for, are they unanimous, was it a Clinton nominee, and, and so forth. I give, them a, I give them a case, this is the one about uh, banning guns around school districts, then they're asked, do you agree with Judge Jones' opinion, and do you trust him to make decisions? And just leaving the data at this point, Sure enough, it turns out that, that there is an effect here of being uh, given this contested uh, contested nomination battle. And Democrats here, uh, because they might have been more uh, less inclined to agree with the basically a, a pro-gun decision by a judge, sure enough, when told something different about the confirmation uh, outcome, uh, confirmation vote, they, they agreed with him and trusted, had much less trust uh, in the judge. Republicans were unaffected, independent support drops off. And we can throw this in a model again and, and control for all sorts of things. And what I learn is that uh, if you are a strong partisan Democrat and you are told it is a Clinton nominee in a highly uh, contested uh, seat, you like Judge Jones and you trust him more, right, even controlling for the nature of the decision that he made. Uh, if you are a uh, hardcore uh, Republican, if you're told it's a Bush nominee, it's contested, again, it's a signal to say there's something here I should like about that judge. Uh, but if we have more moderate respondents or independent respondents and they're told that it's a contested case and we control for their views about gun policy, uh, sure enough, uh, support and trust in the judge goes down. And granted, these are, these are surveys, it's experimental, uh, we don't know how much uh, actual information voters do get about uh, confirmation contests, but it is at least suggestive that there is a spillover effect to the public and how they interpret and how they receive information about these nominations. Okay. Monty Tripp. Actually, you've already answered that Oh, question. okay. Other questions? Uh, uh, really done. Quickly. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelly McIntosh, and first I'll start with a quick point of clarification. I think some of the back and forth about Clarence Thomas's response to a Roe versus the Roe versus Wade question during his confirmation hearing um, was more seriously about the fact that his sister had had an abortion, and a lot of people had concerns as to whether or not it was true that he hadn't put a lot of thought into the decision, considering that it was um, an issue that you know had affected his household. But going forward to my question, um, a few hours ago. Um, Senator Leahy announced that President Obama would probably announce um, some circuit nominees before the recess, before the April recess, and that there would probably be hearings um, soon thereafter. Um, knowing that about 40-some um, Republicans have already tossed out a filibuster threat, I guess to the panelists I would ask, what are your suggestions or what, what, um, what, are, what are some of the suggestions you might make to the uh, administration about getting their nominees through? <laughs> well, I think, first of all, uh, following up on our, our previous discussion, um, President Obama probably needs to lay out what his principles of selection are. And in a way that's clear and simple and honest and that reflects his values, 
and the values that he wants to see uh, in uh, a, an appellate judge. I think there's a real opportunity for leadership. I think the public doesn't really understand uh, the issues. I think the public is tired of some of the uh, uh, formulaic pablum that, that's come out on this subject. And if he can give a very clear and candid and understandable uh, version of what it is he's, he's looking for, in a judge, I think the public will become a part of the process. Now, he's got the mechanisms now to, to get his, his voice out and to get those 12 million people on his uh, email list uh, thinking about these things. So that could be uh, a significant uh, uh, factor. Uh, secondly, if the Republicans have already threatened to filibuster without knowing what his principles are or what his nominations are, I think they have uh, suggested that they're not in good faith. Uh, if they want to be part of the process and they want their advice to be listened to, I think they have to show some, some good faith here. So um, I, I think that's a, a strategic mistake on their part. How many people signed that letter? How many? Uh, that's you know that's kind of a shame because I think you know I am a believer in bipartisanship as as you can tell from my opening remarks that's the way I was brought up in the Senate nothing happened that wasn't bipartisan and I think there's the same potential for bipartisanship in the Senate now that there was then we had no, we didn't issue it but somebody issued a list of 17 people that might have voted 17 Republicans who might have voted against the nuclear option. I thought it was a, a pretty good list. Well, seven of those people eventually became part of the gang of 14. But I think there are still Republicans out there who are not really desirous of going in lockstep with the most extreme parts of their party, and they ought to have the fortitude and the willingness to get together and... and uh, be a force, and I think they can be, especially on judges. We've got one final question. I believe we have a reporter from the National Journal, yeah. Amy Carter. Uh, why don't you? I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Everybody. Carter. <laughs> um, I had a question about the executive branch nominations. There's been some criticism in the news about the power that czars have been increasingly having in the Obama administration. And Senator Byrd expressed that in a letter to Obama and then also in um, another professor in the Washington Post. So what's your take on that? Should czars undergo Senate confirmation? Should their power be reined in because they're not going through that confirmation? What are your comments on that? This is like the uh, car czar and the energy czar and those people in the White House that are going to be advising, I think, the president on policy or maybe even making policy decisions. I don't know. Should those be subject to Senate confirmation? Look at me. Anybody? I, I thought about it when I read that article, and, and uh, I thought there was a pretty good case made for the idea that if these people are actually exercising line authority, then uh, maybe they should be uh, part of the confirmation process. But in most cases, uh, they're not. Um, they are advisors to the president. They are uh, coordinators of, of the cabinet. Uh, so uh, I, I guess, especially in view of the fact that the confirmation process is running so far behind and is creating uh, so many problems, I, I think for the good of the nation, the president needs to get his team together. And if he wants some of those uh, people uh, to be White House staff uh, or czars. I, mean, I don't think we call them czars as much anymore. Um, it's probably better not to call them czars because it sounds like a czar ought to be confirmed. Carol Browner said she preferred empress. <laughs> I would just wrap up that the centralization of power in the White House has been underway early since 1980s, uh, early for President Reagan, and tinkering with the or adding more uh, confirmation of confirmable posts. Uh, that may have an effect, but I don't think it under really changes the nature of how uh, decision-making uh, works in a new administration. So 
I that issue arose when uh, Tom Ridge was appointed the uh, Homeland Security Advisor. We ended up with the department, so uh, he, was, he was eventually confirmed. Well, thank you uh, all for coming, and please join me in thanking our panelists for a wonderful job. And join us for a reception in the uh, hallway just outside.